I think it was specifically about shrimp, but let me, let me see. Okay. <laughs> I might be wrong. <laughs> You're just shrimp obsessed. <laughs> What did you think? Yeah, yeah. What did we you... should talk about that fucking thing. <laughs> like, what the fuck did you think of that talk? That talk yesterday? It was like a conference on like shrimp and crustacean sentience. Um, it was a little like micro conference about why we know shrimp suffer and crawfish suffer and oysters. Like, do oysters experience agony? And these these kinds of questions. Um, was it was it definitely dedicated towards like shrimp and stuff, or was it just wild animal suffering in general? I think it was specifically about shrimp, but let me, let me see. Okay. <laughs> I might be wrong. <laughs> You're just shrimp obsessed. Yeah. The, the sentience debate, the moral value of shrimp, insects, and oysters. All right. Well, that sums it up, I guess. <laughs> um, it was a bizarre experience. So I should say I, I could only, um, I joined about 20 minutes late and could only join for about 40 minutes after that. Although I'm not sure I would have been interested in staying for much longer based on what I saw, to be honest. But I mean, the first thing that struck me was just the bizarreness of the, so this was the situation, right? So the first speaker that I hear comes on and he's like, he did his PhD in, um, I don't know, biodiversity or something. He's been studying these like animals and their, and their response to their pain responses and stuff and their uh, nervous systems, et cetera, for like the majority of his life. And they ask him like, what's your take? And like, what's, you know, what's the state of like expert knowledge with respect to whether these things can suffer these like tiny, they were talking about something in particular, some sort of crustacean. And he basically said, you know, I've been studying this for 15 years. Nobody knows. No one knows what the hell's going on. And so everyone kind of like, you know, laughs. We're like, oh man, what a hard problem. And then the, and then the next two speakers proceed to just like completely ignore this problem. Like as if it was some like tiny triviality that didn't affect their whole research program, right? And so the next one comes on and makes some noises about how things are difficult to know, but then proceeds to say like, well, there's a lot of suffering out there. <laughs> We've got to prevent it. And then, and then the next person comes on and is like, I just want to talk in broad strokes about like, how to fundraise and how to expand the research program and stuff. But it seems like if you're going to, if you need to convince people to expand the research program, you should have pretty convincing arguments that like these things that you're concerned about should actually shove And the fact that like the expert panelist you invited on basically said, I have no idea. And no one has any idea. Seemed pretty damning. Like it was a bizarre. Yeah. It was a very bizarre sort of experience. Um, we'll, we'll link the video cause I think it's public on YouTube and people should just go check it out. Cause it is, it's a fascinating thing to watch. Um, and also on display for like a solid 10 minute period is like the ultimate example of Bayesian epistemology. Like if you want to know like what we're talking about, it was perfect. Like it was literally, I couldn't have done it. Like I couldn't have done a better impression myself. Right. It was like, well, we can't be absolutely certain these things can't suffer. So we have to lend it a bit of credence. And then as soon as we do that, you take into account how many crustaceans there are in the world and all of a sudden we're dealing with like a huge amount of probable suffering and it was like well there we go that was the that's that was the trap that <laughs> we're talking about all the time yeah. on the podcast like yeah. it, in expect in expectation uh the amount of suffering that occurs with i don't know a, a shrimp cocktail <laughs> is gargantuan it's it's exactly what uh, what we've been talking about and it was just interesting like you said to to see it on on display in the wild. Like, um, again, like we harp on the whole Bayesian epistemology thing so much because this is how large communities of scientists think. And that just amounts to wasting 15 years of your life on, um, the wrong, the wrong kinds of questions. Yeah. It was a fascinating thing to witness, honestly. So yeah, we'll link that and, uh, definitely encourage people to check it out because it was interesting and maybe you'll have different opinions than us and you can write us angry emails. Um, <laughs> That's exactly <right. laughs> Like we've been getting recently. So yeah. <laughs> let's fucking dive into it. Dude. You want to just jump in? Yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. Yeah. So today we're talking about super forecasting. I thought it would be an interesting thing to talk about because on the face of it, I mean, one, it kind of combines like Bayesian type reasoning, which we've been talking about for a while. And two, on the face of it, it seems to potentially challenge um, some of Popper's 
uh, apparent like results in epistemology. So just that's why I kind of wanted to talk about it, taking a spe- step back. What the hell is super forecasting? Um, so super forecasting is largely it's a research program that's largely spearheaded by Philip Tetlock, who's a, a political scientist at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and he wrote uh, this first book. He wrote a first book called uh, Expert Political Judgment in 2005. Uh, which I read, which was honestly an excellent book. And it was largely a criticism of the tendency of so-called experts, whether they're like political scientists or like social scientists, historians of various stripes, to make like these predictions about what's going to happen in the future. Um, but then they it was they were rarely like the predictions were rarely checked after the fact right so they would like you know new york times articles etc would lar- like ask sort of experts like what do you think is going to happen to the war in iraq or um you know what is what's going to what's going to result from our foreign policy with syria or like etc and uh, what like tetlock noticed was like okay these people are making very bold claims but has anyone actually checked the accuracy of these claims um so anyway the you know long story short he does this like long uh, term study like over multiple years um, where he asks these uh, so-called these experts so-called experts um, in ver- in their fields like to give uh, predictions on the order of like one year to like three ish years or something like that um, and you know the basic finding is that these experts are not more accurate than average um, and out of this he got like the classic or sorry, um, not more accurate than chance, just guessing pure chance. So if you were just like uh, uh, guessing by pure chance, you could do approximately well as like most of these experts. Um, and in fact, a lot of them did worse than just like news junkies who just like sort of obsessively read things like the New York Times, Financial Times, Washington Post, etc. cetera. Um, and so this was like a largely seen as like just a condemnation of expertise in general like you know what the hell are we paying these people for if they just like can't make these sort of long-term predictions and like why are we listening to their predictions then like no one can do this um and so in his second book uh in 2015 uh super forecasting the art and science of prediction um he focused on a small subgroup of these experts um that actually can perform pretty well Right. So in his first book, he's like, on average, everyone sucks. Um, But then like he gets some funding from IARPA, like the intelligence uh, agency of the United States. They kind of get interested in his work because they want to know, like, okay, you know, if we're paying CIA analysts and stuff, can you give us any insights? Like if if there's no chance for them to be more accurate than just random guessing, like what are we paying them for? So are there any insights to be gleaned from these sort of like long term uh studies that you're running about like when accurate forecasting is possible and who can be like what sort of thinking styles etc can be more accurate um then yeah just random guessing and uh and so he like runs another like multi-year study um with funding from the u.s government etc um and then writes a book about it and the result is like yeah most people still suck but there's a small subgroup of people that he's calling super forecasters who can predict um events like you know a few months out to like three years out much better or let's just say better than average and so the kind of questions they're getting are like very specific right so it's kind of it's like examples of questions are um will italy restructure or default on its debt by the 31st of december 2011 or like will the euro fall below below one dollar twenty uh in in the next year so like yes or no answers um it's very clear if you're right or wrong right there's like no waffling because that was kind of one of the results of his first book on the subject was that these experts would kind of make these like unfalsifiable predictions right (laughs) they would say like oh there will be violence in this region or something like that and it was like not even clear if they're right or wrong right so he's like giving them very black and white answers that have a yes or no answer by a clear date and so he can like tally up the actual their actual accuracy um, and so he's finding like this small group of people that can actually perform much better than average on these questions. Um, and so that's like the basic setup of the book. And he calls these people super forecasters. Um, and w- so I thought it'd be interesting to one, talk about whether this is like a challenge to Popper's uh, epistemological result that says like, basically we can't predict the future. Right. Um, and two, If whether just from a policy perspective, like if you were in government, would you listen to this? Because he, you know, right now he's like being uh, 
he's be i think he's like works with the u.s uh security services and stuff um the cia and he is like writing he you know he writes these op-eds and these uh papers and stuff some which we can link to that talk about like the ability of super forecasters to improve the u.s's uh foreign policy and stuff because you know if they if you can if you can foresee the future obviously that's gonna help you um in your like political relations and and stuff like that yeah so it's interesting so um tetlock did something else when he um gathered up all these super forecasters is that he would not only ask them to make a prediction, but he would ask them to rate their confidence. Um, so provide a credence uh, along with their prediction. And that's significant for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, this is taken to be evidence that if you think, think in terms of the probability calculus and you think in terms of Bayesianism in particular, um, then you can yourself be a super forecaster. Um, secondly, though, uh, the introduction uh, of probability scores makes it, even harder to falsify now. Um, and so there's a nice example. This will just kind of indicate like what the, uh, the flavor of these kind of forecasts uh, look like. So I guess on February 20th, Tetlock's super forecasters predicted only a 3% chance um, that there would be a uh, pandemic, um, specifically that there'd be a 200,000 plus coronavirus case a month later. So what do you do with that? So 3% chance that then happens. Uh, then people will say, of course, this is what probability means. We rated this 3%. Basically, we're saying it's not going to happen, but it does happen. And now we can say, of course, this is how probability works. Um, so the introduction of probabilities makes the predictions even less falsifiable to the point where it's actually impossible to falsify any prediction now um it it literally makes it impossible to falsify anything unless you assign a zero percent probability but, but nobody would would do that um the second thing which is i think important to know about like uh the super forecaster methodology is that the way that you come up with a bunch of super forecasters is you ask a hundred thousand people a hundred thousand different questions most of the people get most of the questions wrong. Some of the people get the questions right. Those people are the ones you deem to be super forecasters. Um, so this isn't entirely saying that it's like throwing darts and drawing a bullseye afterwards. Uh, because um, So you can then take these super forecasters and ask them to make predictions the following year. And what you do find is that um, those who were super forecasters the previous year tend to be super forecasters the next year, meaning there is some uh, quality about them, which makes them better um, than their, uh, say, colleagues at, at predictions. So it's not entirely artificial um, because of this correlation effect. Is this, um, are you getting at like the um, toying caught or uh, like a uh, toying <laughs> fucking toy <laughs> coin toss um example where you like okay say you ask um like a thousand people uh their predictions on a toy on a coin toss um now about 50 percent of them are going to get it right um and then you flip as you take those 50 percent who got it right uh you flip another coin um mm -hmm. approximately 50 percent of those are going to get it right and if you if you iterate um not too many times then you're going to be i mean you're going to be left with people who have like you know say you only flip it like 10 or 11 times you're going to be left um obviously it's going to be a function of like how many people you started with but you're going to be left with like some group of people who've always got it right now the question is yeah. is this indicative of their ability to to predict uh how, how what was going to be the result of the coin flip no obviously not this is just a property of the fact that you started with a giant group of people um mm -hmm. and just you know because of probability some percent of them are going to get are going to randomly guess all 10 times in a row correctly mm -hmm. um is that uh is that the property you're sort of getting at with this um well so that's one component but the correlation across years cuts against that a little bit so yeah the exactly. coin toss example is good but now you take the small fraction of people who have guessed it correctly the whole way through. Um, and then next year you put them the same thing. If it was purely random, they shouldn't do as well. Yeah. Right. If yeah. it was purely random, they, sh you should not get the same people, but you tend to get the same, the same people. Um, yeah. so there is some, uh, quality there that differentiates their uh, success from other people's success. Um, nice. and yep. super forecasters 
the book is largely about uh, studying what makes people um, super, super forecasters. Um, so maybe actually yeah. I'll, I'll pause there. And what do you think of that methodology? Because I have some thoughts about why it's, it's faulty, but... Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so I like lingering on the met- methodology. I actually didn't pick up on problems um, necessarily with the methodology. I wanted to dive into a little bit about how they're actually scoring these things. Because mm-hmm. so they, um, how they determine someone's score, like whether they're a super forecaster, or, um, is they'll assign them a score across all of their predictions to date, right? And this score is called a Breyer score. For the like ML and statisticians in the, ob- in the audience, this is basically just like mean squared error uh, over all the possible outcomes. Okay, so what sort of score are these super forecasters getting over a long time? Um, he says the first batch of super forecasters got a Breyer score of 0.25. This is equivalent to assigning a probability of about 60, um, getting, getting things right with a probability of about 65% of the time. Or you're assigning, in other words, you're assigning 65% probability to events that do in fact happen. Mm-hmm. So when they say super forecaster, they're, this is, is better than average. Um, but it's, it's not like they're getting this 99% of the time or 90 or 80% of the time even, right? Like I think the best prior score he talks about in the book is 0.2, which is still only about like between 65 and 70% of the time getting it right. So super forecaster, even just the name is like slightly misleading, right? This is still very, when you make a prediction, this is not at all saying that this thing is like very, very likely to happen based on your track record, right? This is not, these people are like not predicting the future with, you know, some crystal ball that's 95% accurate or something. Mm -hmm. Um, This is still only like 65 to 70. So that honestly kind of surprised me Um, and something he like doesn't really say in the book. Uh, so anyway, that's my comment about the methodology. Yeah. There's a blog post written about this. Um, super forecasters can be 100% correct about all of the stuff they predict, but still be caught entirely flat footed by the future. Uh, because if you don't ask them about a pandemic, Mm -hmm. um, then they're not going to forecast anything about that pandemic. And if you do ask them about a pandemic and they have no idea like the rest of us, then they're going to say 50%. Um, and that's what a good super forecaster is going to do is just going to say, I don't know a whole bunch. And so when you just look at their overall average, you're not looking at the difficulty of the questions Mm -hmm. that they're asking, nor are you looking at the, the impact, like how important it would be if this thing happens or this other thing happens, you're just looking at the average. And so, yeah. Are they um, definitely allowed to say, I don't know to questions? I don't know is equivalent to saying probability 50%. Oh, I see what um, you you're mean. not putting so you're any just... more credence towards the yes answer or the no answer. So probability of right. 50% l- means I don't know. Um, that's but it's just... not like you can refuse to answer questions and only answer the ones that you're very confident about or like you happen to know a lot about the region. Correct. Like but that. the way that, yeah, but yeah. the way that they do the not thinking particularly about the Breyer score, but thinking about finding the the cream of the crop that is, are like the super forecasters isn't it's about a relative Breyer mm-hmm. score or whatever, right? Um, so yeah, yeah. if you just yeah. find those people who are more likely to say, I don't know, then you're going to get a bunch of super forecasters. Yeah, I think it's it's worth trying to remark on like the psychology at play here. So, I mean, first, like you said, which is a great point, the most consequential things for the future are usually the things we don't know to ask about. Exactly. Right, like, you know, in, in 1992, um, no one's going to ask about the internet. Internet was 94, right? Am I, am I crazy? Anyway, when, uh, yeah, two yeah, years 90s. before the internet, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. no one would have, um, yeah, no one would have thought to ask about the internet. And obviously the internet has revolutionized basically everyone's life on the, yeah. on the planet in significant ways. So, um, there's, there's already condensing down the predictability of the future to like super well specified questions that people can like read about. They're like normally geopolitical situations, et cetera. Okay. And then, yeah, I, I think it's interesting lingering on uh, what he claims is like going on in the heads of these super forecasters that differentiates them from like normal forecasters that suck. Um, and at first, we should say that the normal forecasting group that he compares super forecasters to, um, he'll often say things like super forecasters are like 
60% more accurate than regular forecasters. And that sounds super good until you like read the appendix and you learn that the prior score of the normal super for, or the normal forecasters is worse than average. It's like, it's like, <laughs> um, and so, nice. uh, right. So if you're improving like that much more over average is, uh, not, um, I should double check. Yeah. I should double check that, but I, I think that's true. Yeah. It's like, it's like point, you know, 0.67 or 0.7 or something. So yeah. that's, you know, worse than random guessing. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then, okay. So Tedlock obviously is like thinking about this in terms of probabilities, like having credences over things, putting odds on things. Um, but when he's actually describing like the psychologies that do better at predicting, quote unquote, predicting the future, um, he'll say things like, uh, quote, the best forecasters would approach seemingly intractable questions by decomposing them into parts, uh, researching the past frequency of similar events, um, and continually updating their estimates as new information emerged. Okay, so he calls these kind of people foxes. So they're not um, looking at everything through the lens of like very particular ideologies. Um, they're always on the lookout for like new information that could contradict their beliefs. Um, they're always trying to update their beliefs in light of like new evidence and new things going on in the world. Um, and one thing about the second tournament that differentiated it from the first that he, that he wrote about in his first book is that super forecasters were always allowed to update their estimates, right? Until the day when, you know, something did or didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, you could frame, you can frame this in terms of like Bayesian updating and stuff, but you could also frame this as just like, these people are gathering a lot of information about the world, criticizing their views um, and trying to come up with the best explanation of what's happening. So like, there's no reason there couldn't have been a Philip Tetlock who was not a Piper Bayesian and was just like a Paparian, right? And wrote yeah, about exactly, everything in terms exactly, of like exactly. criticizing your beliefs, trying to be more accurate. And like what I, what I take here is that he's saying people who don't hold super firm ideologies and are ready to like change their guesses based on new evidence and new information or more likely to like be more accurate about the world. And I don't think that's super surprising, right? Like people who view everything through a particular lens, like American imperialism or something are like, of course, they're more likely to think that America is like going to cause a war somewhere. Or their foreign policy is going to be terrible, right? Like the, you know, if, if you're like a Paul Krugman, who's like always making arguments on the left or like a Yaron Brook or something, who's like uh, enamored with the right. I think, of course, you're going to be less accurate than someone who's like pretty agnostic, uh, politically about those questions doesn't have anything to prove there. And it's just trying to like really figure out what's going on in the world. That doesn't seem incredibly surprising, right? Like mm -hmm. if, if you have a stake in whether like Putin is going to abdicate his seat in five years, um, based on like some, you know, geopolitical book about geopolitics that you wrote, um, maybe you like really have a stake in answering a certain way, but for the rest of us, like, you know, it's pretty clear just Putin's like a power hungry guy. And, you know, you'd probably put some decent probability on the fact that he'll, unless he dies, you know, he's going to still be in power and like, mm -hmm. um, in like five years. And so a bunch of guesses like that doing better than average doesn't really surprise me mm -hmm. that much, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, and yeah. Just to echo what you're saying. So the other thing we should link to is, uh, Scott Alexander's excellent, um, review of super forecasters because it's a phenomenal, uh, review. And uh, he highlights a quote from the book, which says basically exactly what you just said. No, not exactly, mm -hmm. but similar. It says that uh, super forecasters are a numerate bunch. Uh, many knew about Bayes' theorem and could deploy it if they felt it was worth the trouble. But they rarely crunch the numbers so explicitly. Mm -hmm. What mattered more for super forecasters than Bayes' theorem is Bayes' core insight of gradually getting closer to the truth by constantly updating in proportion to the weight of the evidence. Um, Okay, so that sounds kind of Bayesian, but then uh, he continues. He says, um, this is true particularly of Tim Minto, the top super forecaster. Um, he knows Bayes' theorem, but didn't use it even once to make his hundreds of updated forecasts. Um, and yet Minto appreciates the Bayesian spirit. So Minto is a Bayesian who doesn't use Bayes' theorem, <laughs> and that paradoxical description applies to most super forecasters. Again, it's only paradoxical... <laughs> if you <laughs> fail to realize that what they're doing is being self-critical um, and yeah. by updating according to the evidence, what that means is they're just listening to other people and 
letting other people uh, change their mind upon hearing good arguments and all the like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The, the it's it's not a paradox. It's only a paradox to the Bayesian who doesn't realize that what's going on under the surface is that he's basically just using good common sense. Um, and and this is true of like uh, Julia Galeth as well, who's who's an excellent mm-hmm. uh, public intellectual, and she talks a lot about Bayes theorem. But it, really, she just is using it as a a metaphor, uh, is an attitude to be open and receptive to information which might change your mind and that is great fucking advice and everyone should do that and if you want to call that bayesian by all means but um but one doesn't need to to memorize um algebraic rules to download the core insight which is just be open-minded and don't be ideological and continue to uh um change your mind when new information uh, presents itself so yeah exactly (laughs) <laughs> um he has this weird quote in this foreign affairs piece um where he's talking about like the relevance of forecasting for policy and stuff and he says um as forecasts change and individual questions are answered by the course of events the view of the far off future becomes a little clearer analysts can then update their scenarios and generate new clusters of questions uh they can d- thus develop a cont- continually evolving sense of plausible futures uh as well as a probabilistic estimate of which policies will yield the most bang for the buck etc but if you're just like the whole point there was that you're getting feedback because f- these questions are being answered by the course of future events why do you need forecasters just wait till they're answered by the course of future <laughs> events like i i don't know yeah. it was it was weird like he was trying to yeah talk about the relevance of super forecasters um which I mean, I, that's kind of an interesting question, right? Like, if let's say you're like in a you're you know policy maker for like the U.S. government or something, um, to what extent would you like employ these super forecasters? I would not. <laughs> like, I <laughs> the other thing is that they don't make the data available, so I don't know the actual questions that are being asked. And oh, like, really? No, I would not use this if I was the U.S. government. But I also don't have the full information, and perhaps they're just more a very great consultancy service that recommends people take into account more evidence before they act. So like, I don't even know what they do because it's kind of clouded behind a a veil of secrecy a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It strikes me that there's like a a just difference I noticed with like EAs and other groups of people where like, they're like very focused on optimization. Right. So like, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of the fact that you can't be that accurate about whatever you do, you are trying to be the most accurate you can, you know, like 63% accuracy is better than 62% accuracy. Um, and so like, but you know, let's get all the people who are 63% accurate and like listen to them and, uh, try and build policy around that. Um, as opposed to like a sort of like robustness approach, where you're trying to like build policies around the fact that like, okay, we don't really know what's going to happen here. We need to be robust to a lot of different things happening. Uh, we need to be like proactive in trying to like make things happen instead of yeah. just like yeah. predicting whether they will happen. Right. So like, I think if I was in a policy position in the U S like I'd, I'd listen to the arguments. I probably wouldn't lend much weight to the probabilities mostly because w- one, I'm not sure what it would mean for like their probabilities to actually be accurate for like a given event. Like that's still, that still is confusing because <laughs> these things are happening once. Um, but, and, but the, you know, the problem is you don't know when they're going to be wrong, right? Like the, you know, what you really want to know is like a probability of like, when are their probabilities wrong, which of course they can't give you. Yeah, um, yeah. and, and like what this, what the fuck's going to happen if they are wrong. Right. So it's, it seems like you really don't want to p- put all your, uh, car, you know, you don't want to, um, assume they're going to be right, build policy off of that and then mm-hmm. just be fucked <laughs> when they're, when they're <laughs> wrong, right? Like the 40% of the time that they are wrong. Um, and so anyway, yeah, I mean, to be fair to Tetlock, he did write this uh, foreign affairs piece where he talked about these two different approaches to policy. And like one was the super forecasting approach where you like take these super forecasters very seriously, you build policy around the predictions. The other approach was what he called scenario planning when you try mm-hmm. and like envisage all the things that could happen um, and then try and like build policy based off that. But he said, you know, the problem with that is like, we have pretty wild imaginations and it's easy to come up with just like so many different conflicting scenarios that it's then impossible to go from there and like build coherent policy from that. Um, so, you know, I somewhat take his point there that we can't just like envisage every counterfactual and then try and plan accordingly. Right. Like you, you can only be robust to a certain extent. So, but you know, policy, uh, I do get that like policy is a very 
finicky game and like sometimes you really only have like one shot to do something or there's like severe time pressure you have to make one call and in those sort of situations um like you know the uh you know when obama's deciding whether he's gonna raid islamabad do you listen to your super forecasters there right like maybe you know i'd be kind of tempted um yeah it's it, it's a good point because I think that there is like some deep part of us that would love to be able to know the future. And like mm-hmm. if you are like in the Oval Office and you have to make this decision, I imagine it's quite mm-hmm. reassuring to be able to turn to a super forecasting group and and think that the number you're given somehow represents what's actually going to to happen. Yep. Um, like it, it doesn't, but I, I can see why there's a market for this, right? Let people want to be reassured that the decision that they're going to make is going to turn out well. Um, but I think part of like growing up and being a adult human <laughs> being is just recognizing that like, like you, you rarely know what's going to happen and you just have to be robust. Like you said, it's a great word, uh, be robust to, to what is coming. Um, and I think, so I'm not too familiar with, um, Nassim Taleb's work because his Twitter presence has just been such a turnoff right. for me. <laughs> but, um, but I think that yeah. a lot of his work, like I do want to dive into it because I think it's very relevant. And, mm. um, for example, the anti-fragility this idea, like, stuff. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like, um, you can see, you can see how, uh, this idea of robustness plus not being able to predict the future, which I think is like a fairly central part of, of his work. Yeah. Um, uh, leads nicely to this concept of, of anti-fragility. It'd be helpful if he wrote one book that contained all the insights that he somehow spread across <laughs> five books. I honestly don't even understand. So someone sent me a message today, actually, an old friend being like, on Goodreads, why did you rate uh, Black Swan only two stars? And I'm like, well, because he could have, it's a, honestly a great idea and something he could have written in 10 pages. Like, really? honestly, okay. mother of God, dude. Like, it's <laughs> he's got one super nice idea per book. And if he bundled yeah. all of those into one book, that book would yeah. be honestly incredible. Like, it would be fantastic. Yeah. But the fact that he just like spreads it across so many different books <laughs> and spends half his time like talking about fictional characters that are like go to the gym um i can't handle it uh, yeah that's so funny um, yeah I, I haven't read it i've just like <laughs> if you know the black swan and you know anti-fragility do you know basically everything there is to yeah, know you know to us, to you know work. most of it you know most of it yeah he uses some different words for other concepts yeah. that are annoying because then you have to look it up and realize that other people have like also yeah. thought of it before but for yeah, yeah. honestly for anyone listening it, leonard mladenov i think is how you pronounce his last name he's a russian nice. fella he wrote a book called the drunkard's walk two years before taleb wrote the black swan and it is much better and much mm, nice. easier, to, not much nicer to read because he's not just making fun of people the whole time and contains like all the insights Taleb has um, plus more. And I honestly just like, I, I think it's a shame that more people don't know about that book or at least I don't, he just doesn't have as much of like a social media presence or something. So like mm-hmm. maybe less people know about it, but I definitely just encourage people to read that book instead of Taleb. So he says all the things Taleb says, just <laughs> fewer yeah. words, which is nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could imagine like a research program that is based on this sort of like robustness slash anti-fragility approach to foreign policy instead of this like optimization probabilistic approach, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're trying to like determine in various scenarios um, using the arguments that some of the fo- some of the super forecasters are giving you, right? Like, and you're not just saying, okay, based on these, we're going to do this policy. You're saying like, okay, um, you know, based on these arguments. Uh, We're going to employ so-and-so strategy because it provides um, robustness against like these kind Mm -hmm. of scenarios, et cetera. Right. So you can imagine sort of like taking Tetlock's research program and flipping it on its head um, and approaching it with this like other angle in mind. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, like I, I do, I do somehow like I get the foreign policy. I imagine it's a fucking high stakes game. You know, so there's, so, you know, I do understand like why this kind of stuff is being funded. And like um, the fact that he's identifying like thinking patterns that let people be more objective um, and realistic in their in like what oh, they foresee yeah. is the best arguments. I think that's honestly that's great. Like that stuff's great. Right. They're attaching a probability to it after you've come up with all the arguments like whatever. I, I don't know what that means. But, the, you know, just the fact that we know that like, OK, you know, people who are ready to criticize themselves and change their mind are can be can see the world a little bit more clearly than 
people that don't um that's a that's honestly a fantastic insight and like worth i think all the work he's put into this um he's got this like sheen of probability that he places onto it afterwards which is not super helpful i think but honestly the basic insight is is valuable uh i think honestly yeah yeah well and he has a um a nice and also ironic uh given how it super forecasting the concept is used um he has a nice uh, 10 commandments for aspiring forecasters at the end of his, at the end mm. of his book. Um, and the first commandment, uh, don't try to predict anything farther than at least like 10 years out because you're just going to fail miserably. Um, mm. so he says the first commandment is triage focus on questions where your hard work is likely to pay off. Um, don't waste time on either the easy clock like questions. Um, he actually, I think he took the, uh, Popper's essay on from clouds and clocks uh, and use uh, the, same, the same metaphor here um, on easy uh, clock like questions um, or on the impenetrable cloud like questions uh, where even fancy statistical models can't beat dart throwing chimps. Um, so what's an example of an impossible question? Who will win the presidential election 12 years from now in 2028 is impossible to forecast. Don't even try. Uh, could you have predicted in 1940 the winner of the election 12 years out in 1952? If you think you could have known, it would have been then unknown colonel in the United States Army, Dwight Eisenhower. You may be afflicted by one of the worst cases of hindsight bias ever <laughs> documented by psychologists. Uh, and again, this is being used by people who are claiming to uh, be able to see what's going to happen 100 years from now. Um, it's uh, like This is definitely not Tetlock's fault um he he wrote the book very clearly um mm-hmm. it's, it's a very well written book and he like yeah. people cannot be held responsible for what like other people forget about their work and, and stuff it's just and so what's happened is all of the the reasonable great advice that's in his book that basically tells people to be cautious and be skeptical all of that just gets forgotten and you just get left with the concept of super forecasting which is then used to um delude people into thinking they can be the expert who will predict the future. Um, and all of the important advice is just uh, forgotten about. Um, and so it's just, I think, important to add back to contextualize that uh, this concept of super forecasting, um, at least when presented by Tetlock, was presented, I think, in a fairly careful, careful way. Um, I think he did do the best he possibly could to um, prevent people from misusing it but i still think it is being misused uh, um there's a nice quote in this foreign affairs article that just establishes what you were talking about earlier actually um mm. it it reads uh so yeah he's talking about um inquiries that like are possible to resolve right so just like uh predicting whether there will be a war for example between people mm. and he says Answers to that type of inquiry are beyond the reach of forecasters because it is impossible to define precisely what constitutes an interest or a threat. To provide forecasts, questions must pass the clairvoyance test, which is to say that were it possible to pose the question to a genuine clairvoyant, that omniscient seer must be able to answer it without having to ask for clarification. Will I fall in love is not a forecasting question. Will I marry Jane Smith by this time next year is. And it strikes me that just like, you know, in long termism and stuff, and just in general, the sort of stuff you're interested in are these questions that are just absolutely the opposite of this, right? Rarely do we ask, like, will there be AGI by October 23rd, uh, 2023, right? We're just interested, (laughs) are, is there AGI coming in general? Um, And then just when it comes to people's own lives, and like, whether there's going to be a conflict between countries, or like, whether, you know, they should invest in something because will there be a payoff? Like most of the questions that we're interested in that really affect our lives in the long term are these questions that are just like, (laughs) basically impossible to answer. They're not really yes, no questions, right? Um, And so, um, yeah, just to emphasize that the scope of like the forecasting work itself, like beyond before we even start talking about whether people are like more accurate or less accurate than chance, we've already narrowed the scope of like talking about the future to like very specific situations where all the variables are defined. Um, we know what constitutes a right or wrong answer. Um, every piece of the sentence is a thing already in existence right there's no there's no talking about COVID-19 before COVID-19 happened there's no talk about the internet before the internet was invented or guns before guns were invented right etc yeah so like um to summarize my view on the whole super forecasting thing I would say that it's a carefully written book 
which is much more nuanced than uh, the way that the concept is used in uh, in the wild, say. Mm-hmm. But I still think that the um, the methodology is um, slippery. Like there's all sorts of subtle problems with it, particularly the comparison of different kinds of predictions, some of which are much harder to make and others are much easier to make. And there's no way to account for that when you just take these averages. Also, the correlation effect I imagining is more picking up that some people are going to be much more likely to say, I don't know. That's, hmm. that's a great, that's a great, um, skill set. That's a great property to have, um, as a thinker, uh, to, to just say, I don't know when I don't know something. Um, and again, the probabilistic way to say that is just assign 50%. Um, but this is not about forecasting anything. This is about finding people who are careful to not be overconfident. Um, and that's great. But that's not really about forecasting. And and when it works, it works because people are basically following the Popperian method of being open and skeptical and critical and uh, receptive to new, to new ideas. Yeah, that's a good two sets. I would say it's a worthwhile book to read. I don't, it's well written. It's entertaining. I think the value comes entirely in the arguments that to, you know, see reality more clearly, you should be ready to change your mind which I think is a valuable lesson. And <laughs> Tetlock, um, you know, gives interesting examples of people doing just that. Uh, the adding probability after the fact, it's just a way to be able to quantify people's um, ability to do this. And quite frankly, it's less impressive than it's sort of made out to be, right? Like like I said, a Briar score of 0. 0.2 sounds pretty good, but when that's only 60 or 65% accurate and like, you know, predicting... Um, certain things just based on what's happened in the past um, is you might just be able to do better than chance just based on that. Right. Um, The other thing I'll say is, you know, if, if uh, so, if I'm wrong that this is actually not um, so, okay. When I say it's not impressive, I don't mean that the people's knowledge of like certain geopolitical situations and like reading lots of books about these subjects to make guesses about like Putin's behavior or like, you know, what's going to happen to Crimea or something. I don't mean that's not impressive. I just mean like once you have that knowledge, predicting what's going to happen is maybe not that impressive, right? Um, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Just like predicting like whether, you know, if you're familiar with like Canadian politics, maybe predicting what their border policy is going to be with respect to Americans, the American border and COVID or something is, is maybe not that impressive, right? Um, so here's my claim that is my falsifiable claim for the, for the episode <laughs> that Briar scores, we won't see a big uh, decrease in the Briar scores um, over time. So I think these tournaments are constantly running now. Um, mm-hmm. And my claim is that the future, in, unless the Okay, it's a little bit tricky because you have to control for the kind of questions being asked, right? So obviously the Briar scores could get better if they started asking easier questions. But assuming that the kinds of questions they're asking stay relatively constant, um, my my claim is that the Briar scores, won't we won't see a big improvement over time because there's just like a fundamental limit to how much um, people can like guess correctly about the future. And so that they'll just kind of hover around like 0.2, 0.25, um, and mm. super forecasters like filter in and out. Um, you know, if there was something that you could actually learn, like if you could learn how to predict the future, like some people are claiming, then that would imply your Briar scores should be able to go down, like com- completely go down. They should asymptotically mm. go to zero, right? Because there's like a skill there where in every situation you can apply like better and better reasoning and be able to predict the future, right? So you you should see Briar, if that was true, you should see Briar scores go to zero over time and people become like perfectly calibrated or whatever, quote unquote. But I, I claim that that won't happen. You'll just see them kind of asymptote, asymptote at 0.2 or something. And and you would also s- expect to start seeing news articles saying um, building collapse predicted by super forecasters <laughs> and 10,000 yeah. people's lives saved. Uh, right. Sure. Or meteorologists predict tornado comes but super forecasters got there first yeah it's like you're not going to see any of this shit because it's just a it's 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 a cool thing but it's it, nothing can predict the future and i always yeah. turn to uh, meteorology as a example of like a discipline which is really working to make the best possible predictions it can using all of the available tools and we all look at weather reports and we can see just about how successful they are, um, which is to say that they're, they're doing a good job, but it's just really hard. Um, and a good rule of thumb is you 
won't be able to predict anything in the future further than you would trust the weather report. Uh, yeah, nice. So one one little heuristic, I guess. But I don't know. Yeah, I'm glad we touched the subject because it came up kind of in um, fleeting moments in previous conversations. But neither of us had really like dove into it uh, too too strongly, and I'm uh, I'm glad we did. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have an opinion, so I won't be working out <laughs> at us. That's good. <laughs> exactly. Great. Well, I don't know what we're going to talk about next time, but this is a fun kind of uh, in-between episode as we move away from all the heavy logic stuff and start moving towards new, some new subjects. Cool. Um, See you, dude.